Hello, thank you for zooming in on this presentation today. My name is Linda McGinn. I've been a master gardener for a year and a half. I'm a retired registered nurse. I had a career of 40 years in various uh, entities in nursing. After I retired, I went back to school and got a degree in science with a minor in art at GSU. I currently teach pastels at Johns Creek Art Center. Uh, my husband and I have lived in Johns Creek for over 30 years in the same house and our garden has been um, trial and error uh, these past 30 years. Today, um, I am personally fascinated uh, about plant toxins. So I want to discuss why plants have toxins, uh, a re brief review of plant physiology, the category of toxins, plants in our gardens that have them, um, an entity called allelopathy, some notable deadly toxins, toxins we use as insecticides, and plants in our gardens that you think have toxins. Um, at the end um, will be questions in the chat box, and uh, this presentation is being recorded for future viewing on um, Master Gardener YouTube, I believe. For millions of years, plants have evolved to protect themselves from prey slash predators, disease and encroachment as they are obviously immobile when situated. Their defenses are mechanical and chemical. Mechanical defenses include thorns, thistles, burrs and glochids, which is a type of burr. A lot of the chemical defenses are toxins which include allelopathy, insecticides, and fatal poisons. This discussion will focus on the plants that produce toxins, and I'll give an overview of the history, chemistry, action, and current use. There are many plants that contain toxins, and um, I can't include them all in this uh, one hour or less presentation, and you know, feel free to look more up um, if you're curious. So as I said, um, plant, this is why plants have toxins. And here are, uh, an are some illustrations of plants that do. Um, <clears throat> and mother nature's arsenal, as it were. Don't eat them, don't drink them, don't touch, don't inhale. And the dose is the poison. <clears throat> Pardon me, you'll be hearing that. Um, throughout my presentation. Many toxic plants have utility as medications. And for centuries, these extracts have been used for various remedies. Some are used today and are chemically refined and or synthesized. This presentation will not be discussing mushrooms. Um, they are an entity unto themselves and would warrant their own teaching module. So I'm going to um, discuss very briefly, plant physiology, essentially um, the part about metabolites. Um, the primary metabolites are um, involved with the growth, development, and reproduction, and they are the same in every species. The secondary are different in every species. This um, shows you some of the differences. Uh, as I said, the primary Metabolites are required for growth and maintenance of cellular function, occurs at the growth phase. It's the same in every species, performs the physiological functions. Um, metabolites um, involve carbohydrates, fats, vitamins, DNA, RNA, lactic acid, proteins, et cetera. Um, photosynthesis is part of the um, primary metabolites. <clears throat> Pardon me, this involves a Calvin cycle and the Krebs cycle and uh, leaf transpiration. You might remember that from 
science and um, they all perform to ensure the growth, reproduction and survival. The secondary metabolites are not required for these functions, but they serve other purposes. They are the products of primary <clears throat> metabolites and are derived from the pathways involved in primary metabolites. Examples are the phenolics, terpenes, steroids, alkaloids, and uh, flavonoids. My big question when I um, began this quest to learn about them, <clears throat> where in the plant does it occur? Is it a little sack somewhere? No, it's um, found in these metabolites that produce are found in the rhizosphere, which is the root microbiome, the phylosphere, the above ground surfaces, and the endosphere, which is the internal tissue of plants, both aerial and root. What do the secondary metabolites do? They affect immunity, defense response signaling, response to environmental stresses, repel pests and pathogens and act as signals for symbiosis between plants and microbes and modify microbial, um, micro, microbial communities associated with hosts. They increase survivability and or fecundity, also known as reproduction. They are an important source of interspecies defenses or allelopathy. All right, I'm going to now um, go over some of these categories of plant toxins. Uh, the list includes cyanides, alkaloids, cardiac glycosides, saponins, terpenes, and acetogenins. Starting with alkaloids, um, solanine is uh, an alkaloid that is found in the nightshade family. And that includes potatoes, tomatoes, eggplant, belladonna, uh, in jimson weed, loco weed, and Carolina jessamine, among others. The chemical basis of many toxins derived from amino acids. This group includes compounds that induce seizure, paralysis, hallucinations, vomiting, and other gastrointestinal problems, heart arrhythmias, and subsequent death. Uh, they must contain nitrogen to be in this category. Many plants that are in this category, um, as I mentioned, uh, the nightshades, poppies, and tobacco. Here is uh, an example of solanine um, in the alkaloid category. And it's um, the nasty side of the humble potato. High levels of this glycoalkaloid can damage cells causing vomiting, diarrhea, headaches, and even seizures. Cooking will not destroy these compounds. Green potatoes occur when potatoes are improperly stored. They're old or, and or exposed to light. Chlorophyll makes them green and the toxin acts to protect them from being eaten. Uh, wisdom on mother nature's part. It's okay to put green potatoes in the compost pile. The solanine will be broken down. I will mention that potato blight is a different entity. That's a fungal infection. And the Irish potato famine was caused by blight on the monoculture of one species of potato. And that whole subject warrants um, some interesting reading. All right, another alkaloid is jimson weed. Datura stramonium. It's also called Jamestown weed, um, based on Jamestown, Virginia. Back in 1676, it's documented that British sailors ate this, um, thinking it was edible, but they all got sick, quite sick with hallucinations and um, physical illnesses, and they had to be quarantined. But it has now been cultivated for its use as um, scopolamine um, and it's for motion sickness prevention and for sedation. You might have heard of a scopolamine patch um, to prevent seasickness. This is the origin of it. Here's another one, uh, Swansonia, known as loco weed. 
when earlier uh, early settlers brought their livestock to the United States, the cows ate what was in the fields, obviously, including poisonous plants. One of these plants was white snake root. The cows became ill with violent trembling called the trembles. And when people from these cows, they became deathly ill called milk sickness. It was estimated that 25 to 50 percent of the early settlers in Ohio and Indiana died of this disease. One casualty in 1818 was Abraham Lincoln's mother. He was nine years old when she died of milk sickness. Okay, another alkaloid, um, Carolina jessamine, which I think many of you have seen, it grows around here readily. The alkaloid in this beautiful plant is related to strychnine. Eating any part of this plant is dangerous. When bees drink the nectar and make honey from this plant, it is toxic. Honey madness occurs when the honey is eaten and you, those afflicted will have hallucinations, fainting, seizures, and even death can occur. Some cardiac glycosides, uh, another category. Um, these plants have been used for both benefit and detriment since the ancient Egyptians and Romans. Some notable examples are ubane from the East African Acantheria simperi plant and the Strophenthus gratis plant. Ubane is also in oleander, <clears throat> pardon me, nerium is this Latin name, and it is found in the roots, stems, leaves, and seeds. Synthetic formulations of this cardiac glycoside can be used to treat congestive heart failure <coughs> and, <coughs> pardon me, atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation, for those who aren't familiar with it, is when the upper chambers of the heart beat too rapidly to be functional. Nerium, um, the oleander, all parts are, are uh, poisonous and it's one of the deadliest. Aside from the cardiac glycosides, it contains dangerous levels of more than 50 toxic compounds. The toxins are found even in the smoke from burning leaves and branches. And there have been people who have died from uh, roasting food on oleander sticks. There is a yellow oleander in Southeast Asia that is known as a suicide tree. These poisons have been intentionally ingested for ending one's life or for killing others. The toxin is difficult to detect on autopsy. Ubane is um, then used uh, for poison arrows. Uh, for centuries in all inhabited continents, it originally to kill animals and then in warfare. It's poorly absorbed by the alimentary tract, which is your gut, and that means the animal meat can be eaten without the poisonous effect. Uh, interesting fact, um, the African crested rat chews the bark and roots of um, the poison arrow tree and then slathers the spittle on its specialized hairs, which are adapted to absorb the poison. This will then sicken or kill predators that attempt to bite it and eat it. Synthetic formula formulations of the cardiac glycoside can be used to treat congestive heart failure and atrial fibrillation. Curiously, Many insects are resistant to uh, ubane, and it has to do with a transporter enzyme in their cells that affects the concentration of the poison. Uh, as I say in this paragraph, um, this toxin occurs in both monocots and dicots, and is geographically just about everywhere. And as you see on this slide, don't eat poison arrows. Uh, milkweed, Asclepius, uh, is not a weed. It's um, kind of a misnomer to call it that, as with Joe Pye weed. Uh, it secretes, and it's a beautiful plant. You can see the um, lovely pink flowers. It secretes a milky liquid when cut, 
and it contains cardiac glycosides as well as a poison called galatoxin. Butterflies feed on this latex in their caterpillar stage. It's their first meal and the latex can glue their mouth shut as well as um, glue their feet to the plant. Plus too much um, eating of it will kill them. 60% of caterpillars die. Should it survive to the adult stage, the butterfly <clears throat> stores the toxin in parts of its body and birds that eat them will be poisoned. And butterflies, uh, larvae have learned to make a bite at the underside of the leaf axle and somewhat drain the sap. And then they go on top of the leaf axle, make another bite, and then they feed on the latex without getting theoretically drowned in, the, in that um, sap or latex. This prevents them from getting too much latex and they don't die from stickiness. Uh, the National Wildlife Federation is a good source to learn about monarch butterflies and milkweed. Um, please plant milkweed to help save the butterflies. Another benefit of planting them, deer won't eat it. And I will mention there's a, uh, another, other insects that have similar usurping of plant toxins to their benefit. For example, a moth in the southwest can eat uh, a poisonous rattlesnake plant and utilize the toxin for their defense. Okay, bufadenoids is another type of cardiac glycoside. And this toxin uh, affects the heart a bit more. It produces atrioventricular block, which is when the electrical conductivity between the upper and lower chambers is stopped. Uh, bradycardia, which means the heart rate slows down to become ineffective, ineffectual. Ventricular tachycardia means the lower chambers beat too fast and they aren't able to really pump blood and then uh, ultimately cardiac arrest. In this category is a plant called sea squill. I mention this as, one, as it is one of the oldest documented plants used for medicinal purposes. Sea squill containing this toxin is an ancient plant that has been used as a drug and is mentioned in the Evers papyrus um, from 1550 before Common Era. It has been used as a diuretic, laxative, anticonvulsant, and anti-asthmatic. It's a member of the Ranunculaceae family and in that are Kalenko plants and hellebores. The poisonous compounds are considered neurotoxins and have caused diseases in uh, grazing animals for centuries. We um, don't have sea squill in this area, I believe. It's mostly in the Mediterranean, but it's pretty. Okay, hellebores uh, are also in the ranunculae family. I happen to have a Ranunculus here, let me see if you can see that. It's a beautiful plant. It's also called Turkish cap. And it, back to hellebores, they're all toxic and bitter tasting. Um, they burn the inside of the mouth and throat and cause vomiting as well as neurological symptoms. Deer and rabbit do not eat them and it may be instinct. Some people's skin is sensitive to the plant and can develop dermatitis, inflammation of the skin from handling them. In addition to the cardiac glycosides, these plants contain proto-anemonins and the protoxin ranunculin. They can be irritating to the skin when the plant is freshly cut or damaged. The name Helleborus is Greek for injure food. They were used in battle to poison water supplies of the enemy. Uh, and you can be sure they found that out the hard way. According to um, horticulturists at the Atlanta Botanical Garden, hellebores are not invasive. They are not native, uh, but they do not destroy other ecological systems. Bumblebees feed on them. Some species can readily seed and spread, uh, such as the Helleborus hybridus, 
sterile hellebores uh, don't have babies. So check the species before you buy. They are, um, again, deer resistant along with the milkweed and also um, daffodils, which I will talk about. The beautiful plant, there's a hellebore uh, society and so many different configurations and colors. One of my favorites. All right, uh, you might recognize this plant, digitalis, known as foxglove. It's widely known as a cardiac medication called digoxin and digitoxin. They treat congestive heart failure and irregular fast heartbeats. They strengthen the heartbeat. Um, these two drugs are structurally similar, similar, but digitoxin takes longer to excrete and is used uh, much less because of its unpredictability of absorption, et cetera. In the 18th century, uh, the English physician William Withering discovered that the purple foxglove could successfully treat dropsy, which is what congestive heart failure was known as uh, in old days. And he was able to refine the dosage in a 10 year study. I have a cat visiting me. Um, as a former clinical research nurse um, at Emory, I was really intrigued to learn that back in the 1700s, uh, someone could do a 10-year study um, on the dosage of this plant. In medieval times, it was used to treat epilepsy, goiters, tuberculosis, and as an emetic. An emetic is something that makes you vomit. And this is an example of the dose uh, is a poison. An overdose um, causes digitalis toxicity and the opposite effect, which would be heart failure. Right. The um, buttercup, this beautiful yellow plant, um, causes the poisonous effects cause stimulation then depression of the central nervous system. Death is by heart failure. It's a large family, more than 2,500 species in 62 genera. Many traditional Eastern and Asian medicines have used and still use this plant to boost the immune system, treat hay fever and symptoms of menopause. But the potential side effects um, are dangerous and um, they have limited use in Western medicine. Back in ancient times, cooking, uh, or roasting the tubers inactivated the toxin and they were a source of food uh, that was collected in the wild. Okay, the next category, as I take a sip of water, ooh, is saponins. And here's a list of some of the plants I'll be talking about. Starting out with um, the soap bark tree called soapwort. Uh, saponins are both water and fat soluble. They are bitter tasting chemicals that act as a plant's defense mechanism. In water, they can foam and be a natural pesticide. This action occurs by penetrating the outer layer of the larvae and destroying the guts of the larva and the insect. Soapwort was used in ancient times as a soap, hence its name. We can visualize the foaming up of it, and it reduces the surface tension of water. Another one is horse chestnut. This tree contains it, and when it's eaten, um, it will cause mild to moderate symptoms, uh, but it will make animals sick uh, as opposed to people. And the chestnuts can easily be mistaken for edible ones. You'll see an example here of a defense mechanism, these burrs on the um, chestnuts, which as we well know, resemble um, gumball tree balls. Okay, saponins are uh, also in beans and legumes, soybeans, chickpeas, kidney beans, navy beans, and fava beans all contain saponins as well as other toxic chemicals. They are both beneficial and deleterious. Some of the edible leaves contain toxins. Um, you may have heard of favism, 
which is a hereditary disease that is triggered by eating fava beans. Again, hereditary. An enzyme deficiency in the blood results in hemolytic anemia. Hemolytic means that the red blood cells are destroyed. And other beans in excess can cause an increase in intestinal permeability and damaged cells. Uh, again, in excess, um, intestinal permeability means um, nicknamed or called leaky gut. Um, as an aside, uh, aquafaba is a liquid uh, form, uh, a can of chickpeas or beans, and the aquafaba is used as a vegan substitute to make meringues and other egg white recipes. It builds foams and emulsions uh, out of air and water due to the pH and protein contents. Soaking and cooking beans um, doesn't really decrease the level of saponins, but again, um, the dose is a poison and we uh, aren't terribly threatened by them in the amounts that we eat. Largest and most diverse group of naturally occurring compounds, terpenes provide fragrance, taste, and pigment to plants. They, are, they also attract insect pollinators. They are anti-insect, anti-herbivore, antimicrobial, antifungal, and other properties. Tea tree oil from the tea tree and lemongrass uh, are sold as insecticides and also for the treatment of lice. Again, the dose makes a poison. Uh, insofar as citrus fruits, thyme, curcumin, which is an ingredient in turmeric, and excessive doses of tea tree oil can have neurotoxic effects. Uh, obviously, excessive doses is the key word here, the phrase. Euphorbia is an extremely large um, genus, and some of the deadliest poisons, poisonous plants are in this category. It's known as a spurge family, and the milky sap can cause much damage to the skin and corneal damage to the eye. The oils from this family have been developed to use as a facial peel in plastic surgery. The plants that contained forball esters have been used as a fish poison. For example, the Barringtonia asiatica tree is used to stun or kill fish when a ground powder is thrown in the water and it makes the fish um, stunned, uh, suffocated, um, and ready to be harvested, but they're still edible. And in Madagascar, in South America, there are trees in this family whose fumes from cutting them down are highly poisonous. Um, Paul Blackmore at the Botanical Garden told me of when he lived in Africa that they would have to wear a hazmat suit to cut down um, some of these euphorbia trees. Poinsettias are in this category and the milky sap can be a source of irritation. Obviously pets and children shouldn't eat poinsettias. Uh, they're not a deadly toxin in and of themselves, but um, I think it's pretty well known uh, not to have pets around poinsettias or little tiny children. This is an, uh, a photo that I took uh, when I went to the Botanical Garden and uh, Paul Blackmore, who's a Fuqua Conservatory manager, took me on a tour. He demonstrated the oozing of the latex from this plant when he cut it with a knife tip. Touching or inhaling the latex would give symptoms of poisoning. There are many fascinating plants in this category at the Botanical Garden. All right, now uh, acetogenins um, is a uh, category and these um, contain a lot of beneficial functions, but as they have neurotoxins in their seeds and leaves, overconsumption can lead to atypical Parkinson's symptoms. Uh, Parkinson's disease, as many of you may know, is um, a chronic neurological disease. Um, Dopamine is usually pro is produced in the brain, and when that dies off, um, people have tremors and their voice gets very soft and 
other neurological problems. Um, when I mention atypical, it usually is caused by an external source. Uh, the pawpaw tree, um, the fruit is edible and it's the largest fruit in North America. It's a native tree. Lang Lang is um, a substance that's added to perfumes and it can also be an herbal tea. Here's a nice close up of a pawpaw fruit and they are quite big. Um, deer don't like it and it's pollinated by flies instead of bees. Uh, I've been told that the fruit has a banana mango flavor and it's packed with nutrients and it helped the early settlers survive not only for food, but um, the leaves crushed was an insect repellent. The bark was used for kindling and rope and the leaves for thatch. The wood was ideal for carving. Uh, Overconsumption again will lead to um, the atypical Parkinson's due to its high concentration of anonacin. I have not tasted them. I can't buy this fruit in the store, but I would encourage somebody to plant it and then share the fruit with us so we know what it tastes like. Okay, um, here's a list of plants in our garden that have toxins. Starting with daffodils, which I have a bouquet right here. I brought in yesterday because we had that ridiculous frost. They contain lycorene, which is in all parts of the plant, the highest concentration in the bulb. Gastrointestinal adverse symptoms occur in all things that eat the plant. Uh, I read about um, a school in England that a class wanted to um, make their own onion soup and the children went out and gathered up the onions in the field and brought them in and they uh, cooked it. Unbeknownst to them, there was a daffodil bulb in the midst and they all got sick. They did recover though. Autumn crocus um, is another toxic um, local plant and it has uh, the colchicine alkaloid in it, which interferes with cell mitosis. It has to do with cell division. Multiple organ failure can result. In refined smaller doses, it is an anti-inflammatory used to treat gout. Periwinkle or vinca has an alkaloid causing similar distress to that in um, daffodils. However, it has been used as an anti-cancer agent known as vincristine and vinblastine. Uh, it's been, was one of the first plant alkaloids um, to, to successfully be used for that but newer generations of this drug are used in combination with um, others to do for um, chemotherapy purposes. Poppies uh, are, have a milky latex sap in the opium poppy, Papaver somniferum, and that has been used uh, for centuries for euphoria, which is a happy feeling, sedation, and pain relief. And that each of those three entities um, are dose dependent. And that this use has, been, has gone back to um, third century before common era. Morphine is a pure alkaloid and is the gold standard to measure other analgesics. Morphine, mill Liter, millimeter equivalence is um, the measurement for that. Apricot kernels contain amygdalin, which is converted to cyanide. It is also in the stems and leaves, yet the fruit flesh is safe to eat. Latril was der um, derived from the kernels, but it's not considered efficacious in cancer treatment. You may recall reading about um, people trying latril for cancer, and um, unfortunately, uh, it, it panned out as not being successful. Mountain laurels contain um, grayanotoxins, which are neurotoxins. Lethgotho, a nice evergreen shrub, and members of the rhododendron family have this toxin as well. 
Nandina uh, also contains cyanide in the berries. And I will show you a picture of the Nandina berry and let you know that cedar waxwings, um, this beautiful bird, will eat the um, berries and they're gorge eaters. So they just stuff themselves. You can see the little cheeks puff up, um, but it's deadly and they will die. Uh, we do have some cedar wax wings on migration in this area. It's in the south of Georgia as well. Um, it's recommended that you cut off and dispose of Nandina berries. I know other birds will eat some here and there. Um, I don't see birds drop, dropping dead around the ones I have, but I am now cutting off the berries. Okay. Allelopathy is known as chemical warfare between plants. This term refers to chemical compounds that plants release to deter competition from competing plants. Black walnut trees are a well-known example. Juglone is a compound they release in the roots that is highly toxic to many plants and inhibits seed germination. Many desert plants um, have this feature of uh, lelopathy. An example would be in the California um, chaparral. Volatile terpenes are released in these desert plants that can have 10 to 25 foot bare zones around them. And as you can imagine, they're competing for water, so they don't want other plants nearby. Magnolias emit lactones, which uh, discourage other plants from growing underneath it. You may have noticed in mature magnolias, um, it's bare earth underneath them. Here is a um, chart of plants uh, that are sensitive to juglone and tolerant of juglone. And if you um, are interested and want to take a screenshot with your phone of this, um, please do while I take a sip of water. I'll also remind you that this presentation is being um, recorded should you want to refer to it again. Hey, right, here is a um, classic Latin phrase, dosis sola facet venenum. Only the dose makes a poison. Uh, skull and crossbones medical people embracing a new plant that will help save lives and treat disease. Poisons and venoms are both produced to protect the organism from predators. Um, difference, toxin, bite it and you will die. Venom, it bites you and you will die. Toxins are usually passive while venoms are active. Uh, the venomous thing will come after you, the plant won't. Um, venoms are mostly protein-based. The animal kingdom has a lot of famous venom producers, um, such as snakes, frogs, spiders, scorpions, insects, etc. In mammals, uh, the platypus has venomous stingers on its hind claws. That's just such an incredible animal. Bats, hedgehogs, slow lores, are some of the other mammals that produce venom and probably some um, homo sapiens. Uh, some notable deadly toxins, um, you might've heard of ricin and you might remember um, back in 1978, there was an umbrella called the umbrella murder. A um, Bulgarian dissident was, um, shot in his calf with uh, a poison dart that was triggered from uh, an umbrella that was rigged to um, release it. And when he got sick and they took him to the hospital, um, they noticed this tiny um, needle-like dart in his calf, which uh, was proven to have ricin. And unfortunately, he succumbed to the um, fatal poison. Um, hemlock is um, pretty famous for uh, what Socrates had to drink, uh, his cup of poison. The rosary pea, I mentioned because it's unusual in that it's a plant-based protein toxin. Aconite, um, 
including larkspurs, these toxins pass through barriers such as cell membranes and skin. Florists can get reactions from handling and cutting these um, beautiful flowers. English yew, um, this kills animals that eat it um, and people who don't know it uh, are gonna get sick. Agatha Christie based a murder mystery on it called A Pocket Full of Rye. Curare, uh, the poison arrow, this neurotoxin um, paralyzes muscles and it was used uh, in, as an anesthetic agent for decades. Turbo curarine was the name of the drug that was synthesized by ER Squibb back in the 30s. And um, anesthesia has come a long way since then. Back then there were three goals of anesthesia, sedation, pain relief, and paralysis. Uh, it's, as I said, it's been refined. Um, so you can appreciate anesthesiologists of old trying to get all this to work successfully and that you could wake up. Uh, next is um, cyanide, and that interferes with cellular respiration. Uh, I already mentioned the um, Nandina berries, also known as heavily bamboo um, cyanide capsules or tablets um, were given to spies lest they uh, get caught and have to reveal their information for a uh, rather instantaneous death. Not a pleasant one either. Some plant toxins that we use as insecticides, uh, which avert using synthetic chemicals that might do other harm. Neem oil from the neem tree, pyrethrins uh, from some chrysanthemum flowers. Uh, there are also pyrethrin is an ingredient in flea collars. Nicotine um, is used to um, help kill aphids and other sucking insects. And saponins, um, one commercially available, one is called Humboldt's Secret Flower Shield. You could also use diluted um, dish soap and then um, spray that on. The, the saponin uh, content will help uh, prevent insects from destroying the plant. Okay, these are um, some that have uh, poison in their name, but they aren't um, toxins. They have oil resins, poison ivy, poison oak, poison sumac. The resin is called urushiol, and it, that produces contact dermatitis. Um, inhaling the smoke from burning these plants can be fatal. It's going to um, get in your lungs and cause uh, your delicate lung tissues to swell up and they won't be able to exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide. Urushiol is a physical irritant. Most animals do not react to urushiol and the berries of this native plant are a source of food for birds. If you have um, poison ivy growing in a remote part of your yard, consider leaving it alone so the berries can be a source of food for the birds. All parts of the plant contain the urushiol, including the vines that grow up trees, the fuzzy kind of vines. And these vines will not harm the tree. Uh, last summer, I wrote an article in greater detail on urushiol, and it's in the CLIPS newsletter for Master Gardeners, uh, if you want to go back and find it. It's kind of fascinating that um, urushiol was used as a lacquer in Japan um, for furniture and other lacquer coatings. Here are um, an illustration of what the leaves look like. Um, poison ivy, poison oak, poison sumac. Poison sumac is mostly on the west coast. Um, poison ivy and poison oak uh, are in our area and they are native. Uh, this poor person has a nice um, dermatitis reaction, which is what my skin would look like when I'm exposed to it. In the blisters is um, serous fluid, like the clear liquid part of your blood. It's not the toxin. Um, it's not going to spread if this starts to leak. You might know the little poem, Leaves of Three. 
Beware of me, leaves of five, keep me alive. Okay, here's my summary. Um, we learn why plants produce toxins, where in the plant they are made, all of it. The different categories of chemical compounds determine the adverse effects. Plant toxins have been used since ancient times for both benefit and detriment. Plant pharmacology is a subject for future studies. You can imagine it's, it's immense. Um, my question uh, that I have answered in my research is why don't all plants protect themselves, either chemically or mechanically? And what is the deal with psychotropic plants? Why uh, do plants produce chemicals that um, cause this uh, hallucinations and, and other psychic uh, adventures? Okay, for references, um, I do want to thank um, Trey Fletcher, Paul Blackmore, and Dr. Emily Coffey at the Atlanta Botanical Garden for helping me so much and for um, checking my presentation for accuracy. And thank you, Bud, for copy editing. Uh, Tom will filter questions after the media and promotional partner slides. Our promotional partners, and our media partners. Okay, any questions? Okay, Linda, can you hear yes. me okay? Yes, I can. Some very good questions are in the Q&A section. Um, that's the place to post the question if you have one. And Linda, let me just uh, be so appreciative of your background and the dual expertise that you bring to gardening. Uh, that's oh, pretty God. powerful stuff. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. That, that's so, such a nice so, compliment. Thank uh, you. I hope we all are paying attention. I sure was. <laughs> uh, thank so, you. So several good questions. Um, first one, uh, the question about caterpillars, that, that made sense that if caterpillars eat the stuff, then caterpillars become toxic. Uh, one person wanted to know if uh, they, in particular, uh, if they will affect bluebirds. I assume so, but you may know better. Um, as far as I know, it could harm bluebirds. I don't know um, how much uh, or how many of those caterpillars, um, because they are so uh, migratory, et cetera, are um, available for bluebirds compared to other um, caterpillars uh, that they go after. But yes, I would imagine it would be, um, I don't know the exact answer, but I would. my feeling is yes, it would harm them. Well, it makes sense, yes. Uh, another person wanted to know if the Parkinson uh, result uh, from excessive con uh, consumption that you mentioned of some of the toxins, uh, is that a version of Parkinson that can be reversed? I believe no, it cannot. Um, once that damage occurs um, with uh, this neurotransmitter, um, you can supplement it with some medication to try to help, but it's, it's, it's a one-way street. Um, another example of atypical Parkinson's, um, Muhammad Ali from his boxing career um, destroyed that that's an external uh, cause of, of um, atypical as well, but it's it, like I said, once damaged, always damaged. They're very delicate um, neurochemicals. Mm. Uh, another person wanted to know about, um, and you may have already touched on this, but in particular, uh, how the toxins in tomatoes work. Yes. Um, I, again, it has to be quite the quantity, although I know uh, in other animals, um, like you don't feed tomatoes to horses um, and you know, other dogs or whatever, uh, because it'll make them throw up or get sick. Well, horses can't throw up, but uh, it, it has to be quite a substantial quantity. So I should not worry about that tomato sandwich I had for lunch today. Only if you're big as a horse, Tom. 
<laughs> and another person wanted to know really the same kind of question related to the green potatoes. Does it involve the necessity of eating a lot of it or a little of it? Uh, my understanding is um, it won't take that much. To, uh, you'll start to feel um, gastrointestinal symptoms because that toxin, um, it's, uh, it's to be avoided. That's my understanding that um, you see a green potato, don't even risk trying it, just throw it out. Hmm. Uh, also, uh, another person asked about uh, the, uh, the jasmine plants, the Carolina jasmine. Yeah. Uh, does that affect bee honey in such a way that we should be careful? Yes, um, I don't want to... Um, say don't have local honey, um, but I would say uh, you want to buy your honey from a reputable person who knows that their beehive uh, doesn't have this plant nearby. I think that would be um, uh, something to be uh, cognizant of when you go honey shopping, especially in some areas that, um, you know, somebody just is trying out selling honey for the first time or something. I don't want to discourage local honeys. I think they're great, but uh, it is a concern. Right. Uh, one person wanted to know if what they had heard that, in fact, in desperate circumstances, I suppose, for instance, uh, getting lost on a hillside or out in the woods, uh, that bugs are better than plants to survive on. I think that's probably true, um, unless you are really good at identifying um, plants, because um, as I mentioned, over the centuries, trial and error of what is edible and what isn't. And, um, you know, probably back in um, early mankind, uh, they saw one of their buddies take a handful of berries from something and then you know two hours later was dead and they, they learned okay I'm not going to eat that again so yes I would um, I would be cautious about eating a plant that I didn't know what it was good point uh, here actually are two questions related uh, same kind of question uh, about whether or not there are toxins that should be worried about in peach seeds or in calla lilies I don't know if the peach pit has um, the cyanide like the apricot. My research didn't really uh, allude to that. And the calla lilies um, have seeds, which I think they're really tiny. I'm not sure that um, any, well, it would have to be a significant amount, but I, I did not do specific research on calla lilies. So um, I'd have to look that up. This person mentioned, the one, the person mentioning the calla lily indicated that they uh, felt like they got some dermatitis or burns on their skin if they're not careful dealing with the calla lilies. That may be, and that may be one of the, um, the um, glycosides that I talked about. Um, I will mention, I, which I didn't previously, is uh, rhubarb leaves have a, a toxin and you're not supposed to eat them. So, but I would like to learn more about the calla lilies if that's the case. Uh, one person uh, mentioned that uh, the uh, comments about the bluebirds makes perfect sense eating the caterpillars uh, and brings more of a question about the milkweed uh, and whether or not the milkweed diet, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, affects the young uh, birds like bluebirds. And another person asked us a related question, would you mind going over again what that milk sickness information was. Okay, um, well, the bluebirds, um, yes, anything uh, that the, the mom bluebird eats the caterpillar and they usually regurgitate it into the young, I would imagine that would be um, extremely uh, detrimental to the young. They might even die because they're so tiny and their body weight um, for that amount of food. Um, the milk sickness problem was when um, they brought cows over from Europe and they, you know, as I said, grazed on these 
um, pastures full of weeds and other unknown plants, the cows just ate them as they eat other uh, anything. And um, they would milk the cows, even though they might have trembles or, you know, they were, they were sick, but they still wanted milk. And then people ingested this milk and it um, caused uh, a fatal disease called milk sickness, which um, the poison would just enter their system. And at that time, you know, they probably didn't even know what the cause was. They didn't correlate it, but um, it, was, it was deathly. I don't know if I answered that question correctly, but uh, we don't have that anymore because, you know, we're not, um, our cows don't ingest uh, local weed. I think uh, there's been um, an effort to try to remove it in cow pastures. Yeah. Uh, one more question related literally to the butterfly weed again, and that is uh, one person was uh, quite interested in the 60% uh, number of caterpillars uh, that die from eating the latex um, and was again worried about uh, surely with all the caterpillars that eat that stuff that surely it has some kind of effect on baby birds as they're fed. Yes, I can see that because they'd be dropping off the plant and, you know, there's a caterpillar on the ground um, in rigor mortis. Uh, but this all came from a book um, specifically about monarch butterflies. Um, I'd have to double check where this person got her resources uh, to come up with that number. But I think, as I mentioned with the caterpillars, um, learning to make these specific bites or cuts so that they're not going to be dying that frequently. But um, the swarms of caterpillars, um, butterflies that we see obviously have been enough to overcome this uh, downside of, of ingesting the, the latex, which is their only source of food, uh, which is even more incredible um, that they do survive as well as they do. Hmm. Uh, another person asked if the insects that are becoming toxic, either for their own benefit or just inadvertently because they eat the toxins, mm -hmm. uh, does, don't they have some kind of bright color or other attribute that can be, in a sense, learned by the, pe by the, uh, by the animals that feed on them? Well, uh, there's a lot of symbiotic relationships. Um, that's a good point between um, a lot of uh, insects or um, other creatures. As you may know, there's poisonous frogs that um, get their poison from licking certain plants that have the poison and it, it, you know, it becomes part of their skin. And when you touch the frog, um, you know, it's, they're highly poisonous and they're extremely brightly colored. Um, the insects, I would like to learn more about exactly which ones would um, do that. And again, uh, they don't have a specific enzyme um, that would let them be affected by the poison. They're able to ingest it. And nature, uh, as Cosmo Kramer said on Jerry Seinfeld, uh, is a mad scientist and how adaptions have been made over the uh, millennium. Um, obviously, insects have been here millions of years before us um, to manage getting around, um, eating things, and, and surviving. Your comments make me think that there could be plenty of uh, movies made in all <laughs> sorts of ways about these things. Uh, oh, one more yes. Person, one more person asked about um, uh, stinging needle, uh, nettle, sting, uh, stinging yes. nettles, and if they also have a toxic property. I believe they do, yes. Uh, I didn't include that, but yes, that is um, one of the things they have, and they're, they're horrific to try to remove for not only the sharpness, but um, the toxin that they release. Great. Well, that's all the questions that we have listed, and uh, Linda, it's fascinating, just a fascinating topic, and your knowledge of this topic is just remarkable. Oh. I know that uh, anybody who does have other questions can get in touch with uh, the Master Gardener program and the Extension Office, and the information you provided will help them there. 
So I'll turn it back to you for any closing comments. Oh, uh, well, thank you, Tom. I, your, the questions were great and um, thank you for filtering through them and your kind uh, compliments to me. I will mention that there's two more um, spring classes coming up, March 20th, Lawn Alternatives for a Healthy Environment. And then on Sunday, March 27th, um, Introduction to Hydroponics, which uh, is, is a really exciting subject. Um, please look on uh, the website, which is listed on your screen and um, keep up with uh, all the good things that the Master Gardeners are doing. Thank you, Tom. <laughs>